All right, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, I'm Bob Atkins, your host for today's uh, Nano Exploration Seminar. We have, uh, we're very, very fortunate to have uh, Devin Beck, who will be talking about 3D printing of glass. Uh, before we get started, a little bit of housekeeping, the usual housekeeping that probably everybody's familiar with, but uh, I'll, I'll repeat it just in case. So uh, uh, we're going to encourage everyone to remain muted during the seminar and uh, ask you to hold the questions uh, until the end. We will have a question and answer uh, period at the end. Uh, and uh, when we get there, uh, you you can ask your questions a few different ways. Uh, you can uh, send them in the chat or you can uh, simply uh, um, unmute and uh, uh, raise your hand and, and, and yell out. Usually that works pretty well. So um, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and, and let people just kind of raise their hands and, and uh, come on. Uh, last thing I wanna mention, uh, probably people are aware, but we are uh, recording uh, today's seminar. Uh, so with that out of the way, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Devin Beck. So Devin's a researcher uh, at Lincoln Laboratory in Group 81, which is the Advanced Materials and Microsystems Group. Uh, he received his bachelor's in chemistry from Oakland University in Rochester, uh, Michigan, and uh, worked a number of places, including NASA, before joining the laboratory. Uh, and uh, really what he focuses on uh, at the lab is innovating chemical processes uh, with applications across uh, advanced materials, uh, biotechnology, and uh, electronic systems. Uh, and today, uh, Devin's going to be talking about 3D printing of glass with metastable silicates. Uh, many of you probably are aware that uh, additive manufacturing of glass uh, allows for pretty complex structures and geometries that traditional fabrication approaches really don't, but uh, current approaches to 3D printing glass uh, typically require thermal processes uh, over a thousand degrees C uh, to produce those parts. And uh, what Devin will talk about today is the development of a low temperature process to 3D print glass and multi-material compos composite glasses based on uh, metastable silicate chemistry. Uh, this approach uh, allows deposition at room temperature and uh, curing at only 250 degrees C uh, and further allows the properties of the glass to be tailored in a plug and play fashion by introducing uh, functional filler materials such as conductive particles. Um, the hope is that this uh, allows fabrication of a wide variety of structures for uh, microfluidics, electronic and radio frequency devices um, with higher thermal stability and without the need for that extensive thermal processing that uh, other printing techniques have required in the past. Uh, so with that introduction, uh, Devin, are you all set to present? Can I turn yes, things I over? am. Oh. All right, why don't you take it away? All right, fantastic. Thank you, Bob, so much for that uh, excellent introduction. Uh, as Bob mentioned, my name is Devin Beck. And today I'm going to be talking to you about 3D printing glass with metastable silicates. And so the uh, outline of this talk it will compose of you know, four parts. And so basically I'm going to discuss initially the motivation to develop new materials in general for 3D printing, uh, then kind of our approach in the development of 3D printing glass, and then looking at what we can then do with this 3D printing glass capability to fabricate multi-material glasses and functional devices, and then kind of going forward to printing optically clear glass at low processing conditions and our future work going forward. So um, from there, uh, so Lincoln Labs is a FFRDC and we are doing research for the development uh, and needs to address the needs of the DOD and the government. And so uh, for uh, 3D printing or additive manufacturing, the DOD uh, has acknowledged four core areas that they would like to see improved upon and have more uh, a variety and variability with. So those are process controls, dimensional tolerances, uh, basically improving the validation of the parts that you print, and then also developing AM specific materials. And so what this kind of correlates to is that, you know, traditional uh, 3D printing technologies and COTS printers utilize 
uh, materials that aren't necessarily multifunctional and cannot necessarily withstand extreme environments, which is something that the DoD has acknowledged that they need. And so, uh, you know, kind of uh, what uh, moving into what that sp specifically is, is kind of like traditional Koch printers predominantly prints plastic materials. And so there are, of course, printers that print, you know, metals and ceramics, but uh, most conventionally, uh, you know, plastics are the easiest to print and the most vi widely available type of material to print on a wide range of printer systems. And kind of the reason why that, uh, you know, that is the case is that they're processable at lower temperatures. Uh, and, you know, they're, uh, they have a lot of mechanical compliance and flexibility um, to make multi-material structures. And so, but the kind of disadvantage right now with uh, glass structures is that, or uh, plastic structures is that the they have inferior material properties for their kind of mechanical stability uh, over time and for a wide range of systems and the chemical and thermal properties of the of plastics are uh, predominantly limited and so what we kind of hope to do at a uh, Lincoln lab and you know look forward to in the future is to develop novel materials such as maybe like a glass material or ceramic material that can kind of overcome all of those traditional inferior materials properties that plastics have. And so, you know, of course, glass is one of the oldest types of engineered materials. Uh, it has, uh, and, and it has a lot of novel materials in the sense of uh, the thermal and thermal properties and mechanical properties of interest and chemical stability, which I'll focus on in today's talk. Um, but you know the reason why we can 3D print glass the way we can 3D print uh, plastics is because of the fact that it has those advantageous process, uh, properties and requires high temperature, uh, high temperatures for conventional manufacturing and requires advanced machining at um, at low uh, uh, to process parts at low temperatures. And so you know what we want to see is that if we could 3D print glass the way we can 3D print plastics, we would, uh, we would potentially see advancements in, in these kind of four devices, um, although in, in others. Um, and so, you know, one prime example is developing, you know, novel custom optical preforms, uh, which would, by 3D printing these optical preforms, we could potentially have simpler glass doping approaches in the fabrication process. And then also even potentially create fiber optics with unique cross sections. Uh, we potentially could foresee uh, the development of more advanced glass microfluidics or microfluidics in general that have high temperature stabilities that can uh, open up a class of chemistries that you can actually have high throughput reactions with. Um, and because of the fact that glass is such a versatile material to do chemistry in, and that we could also read readily integrate uh, this 3D printable material in three dimensions. And so, you know, we also foresee potential impacts in RF devices and RF enhancement uh, to 3D print high powered RF devices that traditional plastics would uh, basically melt or break down in those conditions. Also potentially the easy, ease of integration and complex radome designs, and then to produce, you know, uh, novel RF properties uh, that are readily tunable within your RF device. Um, we also see an impact potentially in freeform optics to enable the printing of optics that aren't currently machinable um, and then basically improving the ease of integration of optical components into systems in general. And so, you know, we think that if we could 3D print glass like we can 3D print plastic, uh, it would basically enhance a variety of emerging technologies. And so, you know, 3D printing has a wide range of techniques and, and approaches, and there are a lot of forms of 3D printing. And, and these are just some of the you know, basic examples where, where you're basically can 3D print plastics. Um, and so, you know, this works as uh, for each technique, um, there's material extrusion, which is probably the most common form of 3D printing plastics, um, uh, which is basically an FDM. Uh, printer where you're able to uh, layer by layer, you know, deposit material selectively. Uh, then there's vapolymerization, which is uh, basically taking photocurable monomers 
and that you can use light to cross-link in 3D space to produce parts. Um, and that's kind of like a form labs printer. Uh, there's materials jetting where you're basically able to you know, place selectively photosensitive uh, uh, droplets that can cure on each pass to build up layer by layer parts. Uh, binder jetting is another approach where you're able to selectively uh, dispense a binder to basically join powders of plastics or uh, different materials together uh, and then pull out a part. Uh, powder bed fusion is another approach by actually melting the powder selectively uh, or plastic selectively in, in 3D space to pull out a part. Uh, then there's directed energy deposition where you're actually directly fusing material as you're uh, dispensing it. And then uh, another technique that's used is actually sheet lamination where you can take you know, bond uh, layers of, of, sh of sheets to make 3D printable parts. And so you know, all of these approaches are uh, novel in their own right, although they're usually a little bit limited in materials options that you can print with and or restrictive in integration approaches. And so at Lincoln, we work predominantly on the development of material extrusion technologies um, just to basically, uh, because of the fact that we see that there's more, uh, a little bit more versatility in the materials chemistry that we can deposit. And so now kind of after, uh, so kind of shifting focus now to uh, 3D printing glass uh, and using, you know, having that basis of what all these different techniques of 3D printing that are available, you know, we've been, uh, there have been organizations and groups that have actually been able to 3D print glass because uh, one of the first examples actually comes from the Media Lab uh, from Neri Oxman's group, where uh, her group developed a actually molten extrusion uh, printer where they're able to take glass shards and heat it up to a thousand degrees Celsius and molt extrude out glass to produce large glass objects. And actually, uh, the quick fun fact, there's this beautiful display at the Cambridge Museum of Science that shows off a lot of those parts that uh, her group was able to make. Um, you know, kind of the next example in 3D printing glass uh, came from Lawrence Livermore, uh, where they're actually doing direct ink writing of, of a polymer, organic polymer with silica filler that they then 3D printing of, uh, 3D print parts, but then they require to burn off that organic polymer and then high temperature sintering to center that part down into a consolidated silica glass material. Uh, then ETH Zurich and then Rice University mo more recently developed light-based 3D printing techniques where they can take photosensitive um, monomers and introduce silica fillers to basically to then selectively cross-link those monomer materials uh, to 3D print glass parts, uh, and then burn, but then they need to burn off that uh, uh, monomer resin that cross-link in order to consolidate that down. And so while these techniques are you know, really novel, they have one thing in common, which is basically really high process temperature conditions. And so you know, the Media Lab requires the high process temperature at you know, during printing, but these three techniques require you know, a high process temperature during, you know, aftermath, after printing. So uh, through high temperature sintering conditions. And so with these three examples, because they require this uh, high temperature sintering and burning off of organic materials, they have, uh, you know, basically a high degree of shrinkage as you can, you know, quite uh, readily see here in this, this image from, from ETH Zurich. And so at, at Lincoln, we were interested in potentially Kind of in uh, overcoming these, uh, you know, high process temperatures and and shrinkages of traditional 3D printing glass manufacturing by developing an inorganic glass ink that we could 3D print potentially at room temperature uh, and then cure at low temperatures, so that we could readily integrate glass materials uh, into a wide range of systems. And so, you know, the Kind of moving forward now in the next part of my talk, I'm going to discuss uh, some of the development work that we've been doing to actually 3D print glass with direct ink right uh, additive manufacturing. So um, direct ink right 3D printing uh, is basically a process of taking uh, toothpaste-like viscosity inks that you can actually 
load into a syringe barrel and control extrude out of you know, a variety of nozzle tips as you're seeing in this you know, uh, multi-material head uh, display of 3D printing. And so how this works is that that toothpaste-like ink is usually composed of three components, uh, a solvent, a polymer of some kind, and then optionally, you can introduce a functional additive such as ceramics, metals, or a, a blend of different additives. And so when you dispense this material, the solvent will evaporate. And then after the solvent evaporation occurs, you, you leave this rigid structure that you can then actually build up layer by layer to produce a part. And so kind of the key advantages that we find, and kind of as I mentioned earlier, and especially as a chemist, is that I can play around with a variety of formulations and combinations of materials uh, with you know, advanced polymers, uh, ceramics and metals all within one structure. And I can then print these, um, you know, even multi-material inks if you have a multi-material head printer. Uh, and then, you know, the other key advantage that we find is that you can print parts uh, conformal to substrates. Uh, and, then, and then this technique is more compatible with other assembly techniques such as pick and place if you want to selectively pick and place chips. And so we find that this is a, a somewhat a very versatile, you know, uh, platform for manufacturing advanced devices with and then 3D printable advanced chemistries. And so, you know, going into then the focus of one ink in specific, which is our ink that we're trying that we've been developing to 3D print glass, um, we're we're able to take basically a uh, uh, this ink is composed of you know. Uh, three components predominantly, which is our binder, uh, which is a liquid alkali sodium silicate, which is basically sodium silicate in water. And then we can introduce silica nanoparticles uh, to make this kind of, as I mentioned before, this toothpaste-like viscosity ink that we can mix and load into a syringe barrel. And then upon extrusion, the actual, and, and, and in the curing process, the water drives out of the filament. And then what you see is that the sodium silicate will actually start reacting with the nanoparticle surface to pr produce this very rigid glass composite. And, um, and so what's also interesting about this ink is that because we can kind of introduce different nanoparticles, we can tune the properties of that ink. And I'll go into that more going forward. And so with this system, we're able to you know, 3D print at 3D print our ink at room temperature. But you know, what we want to know too, and what we wanted to show as well, is that what are the actual real rheological properties of ink, our ink? How much filler can we introduce uh, and particles can we introduce into the ink system in order to make this you know, novel 3D printable glass that we can then also uh, that we can print at room temperature, but then also retains structural integrity in the print process. And so um, and as you can imagine, like a toothpaste-like ink system, uh, it when you extrude it, it retains its structure. And so, uh, basically, the property of 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 test uh, or the test method and kind of formal definition of that ret uh, tension of that structure is the yield stress of the ink. And then this is what happens actually when the storage and loss modulus of the ink actually converges. And what we see is that when we actually increase the solids loading of our ink system, we can generate a higher and higher yield stress to a point of failure. Um, so which shows us that our material can actually support its own weight when it's out of the nozzle and it's not going to just reflow. And then so, uh, and then also the other property of the ink that we're interested in is how readily this ink can actually come out of the nozzle tip of interest. And so what we see is that by also retaining this 72 weight percent structural filler in our sodium silicate binder, we can actually have a, an ink that has a uniform uh, viscosity versus shear rate profile that shear thins uh, smoothly out of the nozzle. And so what this data then tells us is that we can actually then go through this you know, unique workflow of printing. So we can, you know, easily print parts at room temperature that then have, you know, support on each layer and that 
uh, that uh, the ink will also print continuously out of the nozzle tip. And then what furthermore we see by being able to print parts at room temperature, we're able to print on a wide range of substrates such as plastics, metals, glasses, and even silicon. And we can even print directly into mediums such as like gels or waxes to make unique uh, freeform structures. And you know, the second part of this kind of workflow is that then we cure the ink system after we, we print it at a, by immersing the part into mineral oil bath at 250 degrees Celsius. And this kind of uniformly heats, print, uh, uniformly heats the part for a slow diffusion of water. And this approach minimizes porosity and part shrinkage. And it has a minimal energy requirement that then is kind of compatible with a wide range of materials and substrates. And by after this cure, then what we need to do is wash off the, any residual mineral oil in order to produce this like fully inorganic part, which you can simply do by sonicating an IPA for a long period of time or a short period of time in toluene. And so, you know, overall this process is, is quite simple to make fully inorganic glass parts that you can print at room temperature. And so to kind of confirm that, um, you know, with, with the other techniques, there was a you know, pretty drastic change in the dimensions of the part uh, after, after sintering and after curing. And so what we wanted to, to see as well is that like after this mineral oil cure, what level of shrinkage do we see? And you know, just based on some optical microscopy and analysis of different faces of parts before cure and after cure, and these are kind of two, two examples here, we see that there's less than a 1% change in shrinkage in, of the overall part uh, after it's been printed. And you know, from there, what we wanted to then as well confirm um, is that, okay, so we have this part that we, we think that we pulled off all the original, all of the water that was in the binder system that then kind of initiates and, and completes the cure of that sodium silicate binder onto the uh, silica nanoparticles that are in the ink. But we want to confirm that. And the way that we can do that is actually with thermogravimetric analysis, where you get a percent change in mass of a sample over a temperature profile. And so um, at these three steps of this, you know, uh, of this workflow of printing glass, we took, um, we did TJ analysis where we were able to show that, of course, that there's, there's going to be a high percentage of water uh, that needs to be removed from the ink before the cure, but right after printing. And then there's this percentage of mass loss uh, after the part has actually been uh, cured, which we see is like right around 4%. Um, but this is indicative to the next profile, which after the part has been rinsed, we see no change in mass over, over a thermal profile of 950 degrees Celsius. And so what this kind of tells us is that basically the wash process works to remove the majority of the mineral oil um, uh, through aggressive IPA sonication. And so kind of, and then also what this tells us too is that we have you know, the thermostability of a part initially at at least 950 degrees Celsius. And so kind of the next thing we wanted to confirm is whether or not, um, whether or not this ink system after we cure it kind of has sim similar chemical stability as glass. And so we actually, uh, in a previous paper that we published, uh, we were working on making thin films of this identical chemistry. And we exposed this material to a wide range of, of aggressive uh, solvents and acids and bases. And what we see is that uh, this material actually only decomposes uh, in materials that traditional glass materials decompose in, which is you know, hydrofluoric acid and uh, tetramethyl ammonium hydroxide. And so, you know, and then so we kind of see that from these preliminary investigations that we have a, a material that we can print and then cure, um, print at room temperature and cure that has this chemical stability. But then furthermore, we even had a little bit of fun by printing a uh, uh, printing a lattice and then exposing it to a few different thermal conditions, you know, one in this image is a is a, just a blowtorch that we held 
held our part at for a while, but we also did some work where we took parts and we put it into a uh, in, into a high temperature oven uh, furnace to to induce sintering, and so we saw that our parts were stable upwards of 1500 degrees Celsius. And so overall, we're seeing basically that our our cured ink um, after you know this low temperature curing process and wash that it's stable in a wide range of solvents. Um, and then it's also stable at high temperatures, similarly to a quartz silica. And so, you know, the next kind of confirmation that we, we wanted to check and see that, okay, how does this material spectrally behave? And so obviously it's not optically transparent, but does it match spectrally to a quartz silica? And so what we see from the individual components that of course, uh, because they're all silica based, you see this asymmetric uh, SIO stretching and symmetric stretching of SIO bonds at, you know, uh, 1000 inverted centimeters and around 800 inverted centimeters of each individual component in the binder system before it's been cured, you see this water peak. And then afterwards, after curing, and you uh, take all of these three systems and you basically, uh, you go through the print process and, and cure the ink system, um, we see that, you know, we're, we're, we're seeing that similar symmetric SIO and asymmetric SIO stretching, uh, which matches quartz silica. So basically just having uh, spectral properties matching quartz. And so um, kind of the next part of this talk, since now we have this ink that we can print at, uh, we have this ink that we can print at room temperature that kind of matches the spectral properties of quartz. I'm gonna go over to like what parts that we've been able to print with that. And so, you know, these, um, you know, kind of this snapshot of what we're able to do, and as a quick snapshot, is that we have this, this ink that is composed of the sodium silicate binder with a water-based solvent. And then after basically driving off the water uh, through a mineral oil cure, we, we see all these unique properties similar to quartz silica. Um, but kind of the next part of the talk we'll be discussing now, okay, since this is this, basically wet ink system, and we can change different functional nanoparticles to produce then, you know, different parts and devices um, that have a wide range uh, or these kind of three different distinct functions. And so one of the first functions is that actually making a freeform structure with a phosphorescent additive. And so because of this ink, we are able to swap out our functional particle with a phosphorescent phosphorescent particle. And because we can print at room temperature, we can actually print structures that are embedded into a wax medium uh, to produce this like really awesome uh, Leger jus, but that is freeform. So this is one single filament that, uh, or so I guess three single filaments for the two L's and then the Leger jus in the center um, to basically show that we can produce glass structures that aren't currently machinable. And then, uh, and then because we can introduce these different additives and print in this freeform manner, uh, this, uh, we show that we can't, we show that this system isn't currently, or these types of parts aren't necessarily printable uh, with other conventional 3D printing techniques. Um, and so the next function that we, we are able to see whether or not would be uh, uh, developable uh, with this ink system is to produce uh, electronics with this glass ink system. And so, first of all, we want to, in order to 3D print uh, electronics, you generally speaking need a conductor and a dielectric material. Um, and so, you know, here we show that we can actually change out then this, you know, functional additive with a silver flake. And then we can 3D print actually with this silver flake ink uh, resistors. So this is a silver flake glass composite ink that we can 3D print resistors at varying trace length directly onto a uh, glass or to silicon. And that actually follows an expected trend where the measured resistance changes over the trace length. Uh, then you know, if we want to, we can take that glass ink system and actually 3D print a shell of a capacitor and then produce a whole separate other ink that you can actually uh, change the functional additive um, with a 
material with a high dielectric constant, such as barium strontium titanate, so that you can basically fill in the gaps of this capacitor um, and with a material with a high dielectric constant, which increases the dielectric, uh, which increases the capacitance of the capacitor. And so overall, this ink can be you know, modified to actually print because we're printing uh, uh, glass composites, uh, print closer match CTEs to silicon and glass than conventional polymer you know, conductors or polymer dielectric uh, dash dielectric inks for more high temperature applications. Um, you know, another uh, function that we, you know, uh, we identified that we thought that we could accomplish is actually uh, doing in-situ synthesis of materials while printing. And so in order to show that and demonstrate that we can do this, we actually wanted to recreate the Lysurgis cup from Roman times. And so uh, this cup is famous because of the fact that uh, they, they use gold nanomaterials um, to in they impregnated gold nanomaterials into the glass to basically get this effect that when you shine light out, out of the cup, it appears uh, a green color, but then when you shine light into the cup, it appears this rose gold. And so we wanted to not just simply show that we could introduce gold nanomaterials into our cup, but we wanted to show that we could actually react gold nano, uh, a gold three trichloride and reduce it into uh, gold nanomaterials while printing our parts. And so you can actually accomplish this by changing out that functional additive and then heating our, or, or printing on a heated build plate. And then you can actually selectively convert this gold trichloride salt to a actual uh, gold nanoparticle within the filament while you're printing, which we then confirmed with uh, SEM. So that's kind of a, another unique example of what we can do with this ink system. Uh, so furthermore, you know, our, our, some of our future work is, of course, trying to approach optical clarity. And so right now, our current formulations with our structural silica fillers are hazy and opaque. But then, you know, some of our initial attempts by introducing fillers that have index matched uh, features to our binder chemistry uh, shows some promise in producing transparency at low processing temperatures. Um, and then another approach we would like to take is potentially actually um, uh, investigating different fillers that we can then do low temperature sintering to accomplish uh, transparency under 500 degrees Celsius. And so overall, these improvements are kind of currently ongoing. So in conclusion of this talk, you know, we're working on the development of novel chemistries overall to 3D print new devices and materials. Uh, we fabricated this kind of novel fully inorganic glass ink that can be printed at room temperature and cured only at 250 degrees Celsius. And this printing pathway is very approachable because it doesn't require any specialized processing equipment or high temperature sintering to fabricate fully inorganic uh, silica-based materials. Um, and because of the fact that we can print this part uh, into, we can print this part at room temperature. We can readily integrate a wide range of additives from, from organic to inorganic uh, and ceramics and metals uh, into that current traditional glass manufacturing techniques cannot produce. And so, you know, in the future, we're kind of working also as well to making this glassing transparent while retaining our low processing te temperatures. And uh, you know, right now, I'd like to acknowledge the core researchers on this project, uh, Dr. Bradley Duncan, uh, who is actually uh, my mentor and has been you know, one of the visionaries on this project, uh, Dr. Moses Smith and Paul Miller. Um, uh, I will acknowledge our funding sources uh, and uh, our support in administration. So uh, Bob, who is Bob Atkins, is the head of the Advanced Technology Division. And um, he has you know, provided us great insight and support on this work. Um, our group leaders in the Advanced Materials and Microsystems Group and the following researchers, Dr. Christopher Roberts and Dr. Anna Stairs. So from there, I open up myself to any questions on this work. Hey, hey Devin, uh, that was uh, fantastic. That was 
really interesting and uh, a fantastic talk. Uh, thank you for, for presenting. Um, I think that there's, uh, there's a, been a couple of questions in the, in the chat, so maybe uh, uh, we can start with those. Um, I think this first one maybe you've touched on, but uh, someone asks, uh, is the final print water resistant and how about vapor resistant? Um, so the final print is water resistant. Um, so we, uh, um, so, so yeah, after, after the ink system has been cured, the, the part is water resistant. Um, so actually to the second part of the question, which is basically the steam resistant, we haven't, we haven't tested, tested that yet. So basically taking our part and putting it in an autoclave for a while would probably be a good check, but we haven't, we haven't done that. Okay. All right. Um, another person asks, how about the adhesion among layers and warping once processed? Uh, so the adhesion amongst uh, multiple layers, uh, uh, depending on the size of the part, uh, for the most part, with um, for all the parts that we printed and showed, they were you know approximately uh, you know ten to twenty millimeters in height, um, and the adhesion amongst those layers is excellent. Um, I would assume if you were to print much larger parts, so uh, on the inch scale, like you know, uh, or five inches in height, um, the uh, basically the that that adhesion amongst layers would need to be further analyzed and identified. Okay, um, a couple of questions ask about uh, current design rules, minimum lines and spaces, film thickness. Uh, that can be produced. Uh, what, what's the resolution you can work to? Yeah, so uh, right now our bread and butter for this ink system uh, is printing out of a 410 micron nozzle. Um, so generating filaments and features that are 410 microns in, uh, in diameter. Uh, although, you know, we've been able to print some parts out of a 200 micron nozzle tip, and then we've been able to print parts as, uh, out of up to a 1.6 millimeter nozzle diameter. Okay. Um, another question here asks about uh, electrical properties, what you've measured, uh, field strength, height, frequency, loss, tangents. Uh, I guess sort of uh, how, how much have you looked at high frequency RF kind of things? Uh, so those efforts are actually currently ongoing as well. Um, we are interested in We've done some preliminary analysis of like the uh, the RF properties of of our parts. Uh, I I don't have the they they match similar to uh, quartz silica where you have this kind of lower dielectric constant and lower loss tangent. Uh, although we want to do more uh, characterization on those parts before we publish that. Okay, um, and I think uh, one more here in the chat. Um, uh, why is it opaque? And uh, do you think the final product would have any micro or nano porosity? Uh, so I think predominantly what we're finding is that the final product is opaque because of the fact that there are some inherent defects in the particles uh, that, we are, that we're using, our silica filler, our silica structural filler. And so kind of the, you know, in the future work, what we would like to start identifying are different particle morphologies that uh, do not have those defects. And, and that's actually, it kind of is, is quite difficult to find suitable silica uh, filler suppliers that make um, really nice mono disperse silica fillers at, at basically a low enough cost that we can justify introducing uh, those fillers into our ink system uh, to, to print that kind of tran uh, notably transparent glass. Uh, we've identified a few, uh, a few COTS or commercial suppliers that have some silica filters that uh, index match. Um, and those were the examples of the lattice and the little uh, pyramid that I printed. Um, uh, but overall, uh, it's, it's actually quite difficult to navigate uh, what companies have those particles without actually having to synthesize them ourselves that would be optimal for a fully transparent low temperature glass material. Okay. And uh, the, uh, 
uh, the questions keep flowing here in the chat. So uh, I, I guess that's the way uh, folks are going to ask versus live. But uh, maybe as a follow-up, somebody asked the porosity level after curing. Uh, so we, we actually, that's a, that's a great question. Um, we, we need to do more analysis on that. Um, but for the most part, we see that with the, with the mineral oil process and cure, we see, uh, some, some porosity, but not, uh, it's, uh, we see scattered porosity throughout the, the filament, although it's, uh, it's about, uh, 90% solid. Uh, okay. Uh, someone asked, how does this process compare to Femtoprint Nanoscribe and the newly released Heidelberg MPO 100? Uh, they can all do 3D printing of glass commercially with very advanced systems. Oh, yeah. So this is, this is a great question. And I kind of uh, touched on this briefly, but I'll bring up the slide. Um, so uh, so this is actually, so at Rice University developed this uh, basically two photon polymerization technique that kind of addresses the, so that I believe this is the same in chemistry uh, and of, that the nanoscribe is actually using. So this was a collaboration effort with the nanoscribe. So the, the issue with this approach, but it's, I mean, it's a fantastic approach to produce nanoscale resolution glasses is that you, you have to burn off the organic uh, components to then generate a fully inorganic glass material versus us, we can just kind of throw our parts into mineral oil and heat them at 250. So those are kind of the trade-offs. Uh, the released Heidelberg MPO 100, uh, I'm not 100% sure about that uh, specific system. My guess would be, and hopefully, I'm not stepping on any toes here, is that they're predominantly, based on the fact that it's a Heidelberg system, they're most likely etching into the glass um, versus like actually 3D printing layer by layer of glasses, uh, which would make basically that approach a little bit less versatile in the sense of what chemistries you can introduce into the ink. Um, and then I'm, I, I'm not familiar with the Fento print technology, uh, the glass technology yet. Okay, um, maybe uh, just uh, time for just uh, one or two more. So again, in the in the chat, how is performance in vacuum? Um, does the final cured material generate uh, FOD? Um, so the um, the final material in vacuum uh, after cure uh, withstands withstands. Um, I haven't actually taken it to you know aggressive levels of vacuum conditions, but I mean, we've, we've done like standardized, uh, maybe like 10, 10 PSI pressure uh, in vacuum. And we, we don't see any like noticeable changes just in like the vacuum oven, um, taking our parts and after they've been cured in vacuum oven. Of course, if you don't cure them fully, then you're, you're starting to pull out water and then your, your part will actually start kind of popcorning. Uh, and you see this kind of, it almost looks like a big old popcorn kernel uh, where you have water coming out all over the place. And that's actually why we uh, designed the mineral oil cure uh, is this kind of slow ramp to 250 that then gradually releases the water out of the filament or diffuses the water out of the filament, so. Okay, and uh, I, I guess I understand there's one raised hand. Um, I actually can't see that here, but uh, if whoever has their hand raised would like to unmute and uh, ask maybe a final question, that'd be great. Maybe one last one from the uh, chat. So there, there are colloidal silicas dispersed in water. Do those bring in too much water to the system? So that's actually a great question. Um, so yes, I, I mean, so we can actually try that uh, because there are more monodispersed colloidal silicas that have, you know, that are definitely more engineered silica materials that won't have as many defects as that what we've been using. Really, we have we've stayed away from the colloidal silica, like dispersed colloidal silicas, predominantly due to the cost of of like the actual engineered colloidal silicas. Um, it would be something that we'd have to try, actually. I think um, to answer your question overall, <laughs> um, I'm not 100% sure on how that would affect. But I think that you, you obviously don't want to 
introduce too much water into the system uh, because that would dilute dilute the ink uh, to a point where it's not printable or you can't generate multiple multiple layers. All right, uh, I think based on time, we're gonna have to kind of cut things off there. Uh, if there are more questions, I'm sure uh, folks can get a hold of uh, Devin and uh, ask those directly. Uh, I wanna thank everybody for attending today. I wanna thank uh, Devin for presenting. Again, uh, that was a wonderful talk, really interesting subject, Devin. Um, I also uh, want to just remind folks that uh, the next uh, seminar is coming up on uh, Tuesday, March 8th. Uh, that'll be by uh, Deb Kalpa Goswami, uh, who's a postdoctoral associate in uh, the MIT IMES. And I hope all you can uh, join back for that next seminar. So uh, with that, uh, thanks everyone. And uh, we'll hopefully see you again soon.